Not because the patriarchal language has some troubling resonances, but because the imagery gives us a much richer understanding of who God is. And I think the church has been very slow to recognize these things. But the real issue is that men have often been violent and abusive and domineering. We should simply say that rather than diverting it into conversation about God, no, maybe the issue is not about changing the language of our Heavenly Father. It is about changing the lives of earthly fathers. The problem is not so much the way God is Father. The problem may be the way I'm Father. It's time for men to become the kinds of fathers that God is. And if all men were the kinds of God's fathers that God is, we might not have this conversation at all. The joy of Christianity is that we have been made, you and I have been made in the image of God. And we've been made male and female. But the danger of Christianity is that we are constantly tempted to recast God in our image. And this isn't a new problem. In every generation, Christians have been inclined to portray God along the lines of what they think is right and good and true in their day, in their time. It is understandable for us to articulate the highest ideals of what today we aspire to and to project them onto God. But it's also obvious what is wrong with this approach. It makes God into a product of our creative imaginations. We become the creator and God becomes the creature. We turn into divine editors going through every aspect of God's script, correcting it for errors, and God becomes a show pony for our high ideals. So the question becomes, do we relegate the language of God the Father to one image among many, and a suspicious one because of associations with a patriarchal package of male dominance and female subservience? Or is there something vital about the language of God the Father that transcends this patriarchal package that we still need to keep at the center of our Christian faith, even if it is, for some of us, a struggle. I want to dwell briefly on two themes. One, first, God, or Jesus says, Abba. He uses that language, he's talking about Abba, he's not talking about a 70s Swedish pop group. But he doesn't mean father in our conventional sense either. He's using the word in Aramaic, he means daddy. And if you've ever had the privilege of putting a child to bed, seeing its trusting eyes, hearing the child's son or daughter whisper a question of existential energy, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Daddy, what's going to happen tomorrow? This is a profound, intimate, non-sexual relationship, one of joy and trust and frustration and endurance and touch and warmth and tears and love. I don't think I'll forget last year at this time, Mimi and I were in Omaha and the cell phone went off. It was Memorial Day afternoon. My daughter Megan was calling from Los Altos, California. And she wanted to tell me that at breakfast time, her then 12-month-old daughter Elizabeth had just said to her father for the first time, I love you, Daddy. And my daughter said, Dad, I want you to know that I still love you. I love you, Daddy. That was very special. And I don't think you get much of that word in the word creator. Creator is a job title, it's a big job. But you don't love a job, even if that title is creator of the universe. What God is, Father, really means is that the inner life of God is always a relationship. Always an intimate, trusting, dynamic relationship. So when in the miracle of grace you and I are invited to be in relationship with God, 
we are invited into a relationship that is already going on. We may be able to find other words, but whatever they are, they need to express this central truth that God loves us and loves us passionately, intimately, and we need words to convey this. To the second theme that affirms that God is Father means getting away from the idea that, I think you need to get away from the idea that the Father is singularly important or the most important. I don't think these uh, ideas of a trinity is always having a triangle with the Father, Son, and Spirit with a Father on top is, is healthy. It's not good theology. The trinity is not like that. The trinity we know in Christian faith is not a hierarchy, and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not lesser players. Each has a role to play, and a different roles. When I was playing basketball in high school, I was a star. I wanted to be a star. But then my freshman year in college, well, that would never be true. Most of the time I'd be coming off the bench, but when I came off the bench, I was playing a new position called playmaker. Now, for decades, thinking how old that is, playmakers, that position playmaker has been referred to as point guard. But I reveled on playing on a winning team and what a winning team we had, and it was fun. I didn't have to be the star. I had my role. The Trinity is not a support structure for the Father to be the star. It's a circle. It's a circle in which each person on the team is relishing the joy and the challenge of bringing out the best in one another. Hierarchies can be useful if and when they enable a group of people to relax for a while and know who does what and not, and not get in each other's way. But our station, I think, in life from childhood on is a role that we take for a limited period to get a job done as a team. Once you make hierarchy a fixed part of life, it is a disaster. The Trinity is not a fixed hierarchy. The circumstances of life are always changing. And let us never forget that the cross seared the heart of God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and not just the Son. And so at the heart of this mutually indwelling love is the reality of sacrifice. I hope we can see that God is fundamentally about non-exclusive relationship and non-hierarchical flourishing. There should be nothing in the doctrine of the Trinity that underwrites a patriarchal package that we could be anxious about. The curious thing to see is that if we're going to hold on to our gender stereotypes, God's characteristics often sound more female than male. In fact, for most of the history of the church, it has been women rather than men who best reflected the first person of the Trinity. The challenge for all of us is that God is not a father in any stereotypical human way. It means that when coming to speak of the first person of the Trinity as father, we may have to put aside most of the usual resonances of that term, the bad ones and the good ones. We could say this is just silly. Our gender stereotypes and bad associations aren't going to go away, so why not come up with another term? What is the point of using the term father if God the Father is so different than human fathers? I think there's only one reason. That is because the, this is the word that Jesus used. Father is the word the second person of the Trinity used to speak to the first person. The Old Testament does refer to God as Father a few times, but only a few. But in the New Testament, we get something we've never seen before when Jesus introduces the new word, Abba, Daddy, Father. Not once or twice, but 150 times, Jesus calls God Father. This is the most intimate, loving, precious relationship in the world. And I believe we've been invited to allow a window into this 
Trinitarian conversation, and not just a window. Romans 8 tells us that through the Holy Spirit, we have been invited into this most intimate and dynamic of all relationships. You and I, we have been drawn by adoption into the loving embrace of the Trinity. We are invited to dance in the circle of love. And I think this is the most amazing miracle we rediscover every time we remember Jesus invited us to pray our Father. He just didn't say Father. He would say Father in his personal prayers, but he taught his disciples how did he teach his disciples? Our Father. That is what these precious words mean. That there is a relationship at the heart of all things. By the miracle of grace, you and I have been invited into it. And to simply say Father is not to express our own experiences of God. Our own experiences of God, of God are important, but that is not what saves us. Our own intimate and diverse experiences of God are not the language of what Father is finally about. The point is to say our Father is to celebrate that we have been drawn into Jesus' experience of being part of the Trinity. And it's that experience, rather than our own, that saves us. The Apostle Paul declares when we cry, Abba, Father, is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In fact, if in fact we suffer with him so that we might be glorified with him. Think about that. Think about that every time you pray our Father. Amen. If you're able, please stand and join me now in our affirmation of faith. The faith in which we have been baptized, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, Lord, conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who shall come to judge, judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We pray, Lord, at the beginning for our, our church family. We pray for Brookie Phillips, who's now back in the hospital for the third time, back at Winchester Medical. We also pray for, I think it's McKiernan, Mr. McKiernan from the high school who has been suffering illness and will be on our prayer chain this week. You are a gracious God, our Trinitarian God of love and embrace, who calls us into communion with you and with one another. We pray for all who are, who seeks to be, seem to be far from you and far from others, especially those who are lonely and yearning for friends friends to surround them and uphold them. Those who have may have been felt wounded and betrayed in relationships. 
who long for intimacy with others and are fragile. And for those among us who have been hurt at times, we redeem our broken places. Redeem them through the heavenly depth of your love and give to us an opportunity to trust again. God of creation, on the sixth day you created us male and female in your image. Here is as we in the church pray for and work for all gender inclusiveness and gender equality. And give us the wisdom to see gender as your precious gift. And give us courage to live in all the roles we play. Like a mother, you gather each one of us tenderly in your arms. Hold us together in that embrace until the day when we feast with you before your throne. We pray for the prophetic witness of your church that it may not be silent on issues of so social justice. We pray for your church here, for its history, celebrating the history of its past, including its leadership, and we pray today for the Pastor Nominating Committee that is at work to discerning your spirit to find the next installed pastor. O oh, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear our unspoken prayers, the prayers in our minds and hearts. And may we, O oh God, be the answer to some other's prayers. And as your people, we join in praying the prayer taught by our Lord Jesus, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please be seated. Now the invitation to the offering for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. With loving hearts, let us bring our offerings to God. Holy God, who sent Christ into the world, your love overflows in the gift of your spirit. Now bless these gifts that we offer that they may spread your blessing in a world of hurt and need. For in Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Please note after the blessing, to be a congregational response, a song response by all of us. And um, I want to recognize uh, a classmate from Princeton Seminary, a member of National Capital Presbytery, Jim Lawton, who's here today, surprised me. And uh, also, most special is that uh, this is the wedding anniversary of my favorite um, bride, <laughs> my partner of 18 years, and... Uh, I can't be here without her. She is the love of my life. Um, Isaiah started off with, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all heavens and hosts praise you. And then say, Lo, I'm a man of unclean lips. But remember, after hearing the forgiveness, the love of God, he heard a voice saying, Whom shall I send? And I think God will ask of that of us this day and every day. Whom shall I send? May we with Isaiah say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Now go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion, fellowship, and friendship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
These were unplugged completely. So there was actually really no microphone. Nothing. But it, it sounded like there was something out there, though. That was the weirdest thing. Yeah, it did.